We are in a new book today. We are in the book of Romans. Because I felt like humiliating myself. No, I... The book of Romans is one of the beefiest books in the scriptures. It is a doctrinal book from beginning to end, and we're going to take a good hard look at it. We're going to talk about how other people may see it. We're going to look at it in its context, because you know that when you take the text out of the context, all you have left is a com. That's right. So we're going to look at it in its context and to who it was written. Beautiful, beautiful book. We have uh, to thank St. Paul, if, if you don't mind me calling him that, uh, for writing. He ended up having some time in Corinth, right around chapter 20, the book of Acts. You'll see he had a time when he can kind of sit down and write this letter. He was going to go to Rome from where he was in Thessalonians, and, or for Corinthians, rather. And he was going to go further. He was going to go uh, kind of north east or northwest, but he had taken a collection for the churches of Jerusalem. And so he had, he had a, you know, a big wad of cash that wasn't his. It was supposed to go to Jerusalem to help those who were um, in the middle of a famine and also severe persecution. And so he, he wasn't sure exactly what to do. Should I continue going in the direction I've been going or should I take this back to uh, Jerusalem to relieve the suffering? And of course, you know what he did. He went back to Jerusalem and uh, ran into some trouble there. And so he writes the book of Romans while he has some downtime as he's kind of between places. And it is, it is one of the best pieces of writing that the world has ever been given. And I don't think that I'm minimizing that. I think of people like Luther who got saved by a verse in Romans. And he was in the midst of studying the Bible, believe it or not, and he did not have a relationship with Christ. Uh, you think of Whitfield, you think of so many people, the book of Romans has been incredibly instrumental in the salvation of some people who um, are, have gone down in history as great Christians. So it is worthy of our, um, it's worthy of our investigation and our study. Um, I have to admit, I kind of veered away from it because some of it's somewhat controversial and some of it is very, very deep. And I don't like to cry publicly, so... But I, I, I'll try not to. So we are in the book of Romans. We're going to take on the first 15 verses. It is the gospel of God's grace. And as you read the beginning, it doesn't seem like you're talking about God's grace or his goodness or his righteousness, but it is. And we're going to go through this wonderful treatise. And uh, I have a, a, a platform for you. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, you know our needs. You know our lives. You knew us before we were born. You know the plan that you have for each one of us. And Lord, that is comforting. It's comforting to know that you know everything. You know the end from the beginning, and you know all about us. Lord, we just want to open ourselves up to your spirit today, that you would come into our hearts and meet the deepest spiritual needs that each one of us has. And you know what they are. I pray that you would speak by your word as you always do to every person here, that as they go away, that they would be spiritually fed. And Lord, we come and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to jump right into the book of Romans, but after this... No, no small commercial. Never mind. <coughs> Romans, chapter 1, beginning, Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all 
for your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you in my prayers, always in my prayers, making request if, by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you, but I was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. And I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So, as much as in me, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So we get this wonderful statement by Paul basically introducing himself, some of his credentials, what his faith means to him, who he's addressing the letter to, and then that he's ready to preach the gospel. So it's, it's kind of the uh, drum roll before the cymbal crash. So just so that you know, this is basically how it's uh, schematized in Romans. It, from chapters 1 to 3, there is this diagnosis of sin. And it doesn't matter if you're a pagan or if you are a moral person, you just try to do good things, or if you're a religious person, I'll, I'll let you know what the, the bottom line is. We're all in the same boat. Verse, chapter 4 and 5 is about salvation. What it is, how it comes, how it doesn't come. Israel, I'm sorry, sanctification is 6 to 8. So how... How do you go from being completely lost to getting cleaned up? And how does God clean you up? And that's what sanctification is. It's where he makes us holy and he begins to make his presence known in our life. And we're more in his image all the time. Verses uh, chapter 9 to 11 is about Israel. Uh, 9, 10, and 11 is about their past, their present, and about their future. It's uh, probably some of the least visited sections in Romans because it speaks of eschatology and about the Jews coming back and recognizing Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so he explains about how can you be God's chosen people and then be cast off and then, you know, how, how are the Gentiles grafted back in? And he explains all of that and we'll go over that when we get there. And chapter 12 to 15, it's about church life, how to behave, and something about spiritual gifts in chapter 12. And so there are all of these things about church life and how when we get together, how we should be uh, handling this multifaceted grace of God. And then chapter 16, our personal uh, greetings to people and admonitions to people. And he greets all sorts of people. And there are 26 people he knows by name. If I asked you for 26 people's names just here, would you, you know, you might, might, be, might be challenged. This is a church he'd never been to. This is a church he didn't start. These are folks he's never, he's never gone there. And he knows 26 people that are there. You say it's a small world. I guess it is. So that's how it lays out. Beginning in verse 1, he's going to state his credentials his identity and his purpose would be that we all had a sense of what it is that God has a calling on our life to do, like Paul. He says, Paul. Uh, by the way, that I, I could go on all day about just Paul. It means little one. His Jewish name, when he got saved and came to know Jesus Christ, was Saul, which means sought after one. He's all that in a bag of chips. He chose to take a Greek name, which is very much like his other name, Paul, except it means little one. So he thinks low of himself, he thinks small of himself, or he thinks of himself rarely. He's a little one. And it's a good idea for us to have that kind of humility, I think. If the Apostle Paul, who knew multiple languages, who was a scholar and a brilliant man, if he could call himself a little one and take on that name, I think we can, right? Amen. And especially since... Jesus Christ came to the earth and he died for our sins. God himself poured himself into human flesh, lived a perfect life and died for us. 
and he did not take upon himself the privilege that he was due. Certainly, we don't have room to do that if Jesus didn't. So he calls himself little one. He calls himself a bond servant. By the way, that's a, that's a slave, but it's a different kind of a slave. The word doulos is somebody who has paid off their debt. They've done what they could for their master, and they choose to volunteer to be a slave for that house forever. So you're not a slave by, by chains. You're a slave by choice. You choose to stay and to labor in the position of a slave as a doulos. In fact, they would commemorate this with a piercing. They would take your ear, and they'd put it up against the door, and they'd take an awl, and they'd go, and pierce your ear and pop in an earring, and it was a symbol that you were joined to that house forever. A little spilling of blood on the door and a little piece of yourself on it. It's pretty symbolic, right? You'll never forget that event. <laughs> That's what Paul calls himself. He's a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He's a doulos. Everybody say doulos. doulos. You all speak in Greek. See that? It's that easy. He's a doulos. So he's a small He's a small one and he's a slave. Okay, we think of slavery in America because uh, there were so many people uh, that were slaves. Uh, it wasn't just blacks, it was anybody who was a minority, anybody who wasn't um, of European descent. But you have a slave. So that's what he calls himself, and that's what you are. That's what I am. Because when we were not having faith in Jesus Christ, not knowing who he was, we were slaves to sin. We had to do what sin told us to do. If I felt like eating a whole pizza, I had to eat a whole pizza. I had a 44 waist. I could, I'm, I'm, listen, I had to do what sin told me to do because I was a slave. I had no moral code whatsoever. I was in the pagan category. Uh, you may have been a little dressed up and didn't come from uh, such a crazy background, but I know what it's like to be without Jesus Christ, and I know what he saved me from. If you haven't gone into the stupid depths of despair, God has saved you from that, and you should praise God for that. There were 60 million slaves in Rome. So he is identifying with half the population of Rome when he calls himself a doulos. So it was the worst thing, actually, by Seneca and um, some other philosophers. They said the worst thing you could be called was a doulos. You could get out of it, but you didn't. And you stayed, and you made yourself a slave. That is the, the most bizarre thing that you could possibly do. And that was the mentality of that time. And so Paul identifies himself with being a voluntary slave of Jesus Christ. But see, he's not, he's not necessarily a, a slave where he's grumbling and complaining like Eeyore. He's doing it on a volunteer basis. And he gives his life to Jesus, as, as we have as well. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 to 28, says this. Yet it shall not be so among you. Jesus was speaking of the Pharisees and how they enjoyed being at the head of the table at events and they enjoyed the flowing robes and they enjoyed all of the uh, wonderful things that they were called. They were, you know, called master and, and all of these things. And they enjoyed that so much. You know, they walk into a room and everybody clears out and they take the best table, uh, the best chair, and they grab the guy and throw him out and they put him in there and thank you very much. And Jesus said, it's not going to be that way with you guys. The disciples who argued about who was the best, who's the greatest. It's not going to be that way for you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, you say you want a position of authority. You say you'd like to rise up and run things. You need to be the slave of everyone. That's what the scripture says of us. So no matter what your position is at work, no matter what your position is in this world, Jesus calls you to take the lowest place. It's evidence that you're serving the Lord, not yourself. So he calls himself a doulos. Third, he calls himself an apostle, which is a called out one. 
So it's one who is called out, it's somebody who's been sent as an emissary for someone else. We have people in the United Nations that have been sent from other nations, and we have envoys, those who have been sent out from our country. We call them ambassadors. So this is very similar to that. So he says, I'm an ambassador. I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ, an apostle. You guys think of apostles, you know, like, uh, you know, oh, they're the big, the big guys. You know, they're big, the apostles. You don't mess with them apostles. You know, so this just means sent out one. And it's interesting because aren't you that? I don't think you're going to be writing scripture anytime soon. And if you try, let me read it first and spend a little time with you. Because uh, it, it's not going to go well for you if you try to assert that position. But still, you're sent out ones. We call them missionaries as well. We send people out to start churches, and they're sent out ones. And so Paul recognizes what he's supposed to do. In fact, it's something we're all supposed to be doing. Matthew chapter 28, you guys know this, the, the Great Commission, uh, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And by the way, that's important before he says what he's about to say. Because if he was just sending you out without any sort of commission, without any sort of authority, without any sort of power, you'd, it'd just be you. Which, you know how that goes, right? Yeah, you know how that goes. It doesn't go well. So, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. That means nobody left out. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, or check it out, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. By the way, that's the Great Commission, which is given to every single one of us. So what are we supposed to go? We, I mean, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go make disciples. By the way, making a convert can be a once and done situation where you go, bye bye have fun with your life in Jesus. But a disciple, we saw what Jesus did. He collected 12, and one of them was a bad apple. He took 12 and he poured himself into them. And three and a half years later when he was gone, he didn't leave them as orphans, the Holy Spirit came. That's what we're to be doing, making disciples, teaching them. It's not just about evangelizing, it's not just about having them convert and give their lives to Jesus Christ. It's very clearly about teaching them, making disciplined followers of Jesus Christ. So, you got a couple of those? You should. Because if you know Jesus Christ, you have something to hand off. If you sit through the sermon all the way without falling asleep, you have something that you can hand off to somebody else. If you even just have our, our internet uh, tag, you, you got something. So that's what we do. We go and make disciples of all the nations. He says he has the gospel. I am separated to the gospel of God. And you guys know what that means. It's the good news, right? And the good news, they used to have people way back when who would come and they were called the town crier and they would take a bell and they would say, hear ye, hear ye. You guys were alive then, right? Some of you. Hear ye, hear ye. You know, the edict from the king and they'd read it from a scroll and it was a big deal. Well, it was good news, you see. It, somebody comes as a herald to, uh, that, that's, that herald isn't the name of an angel that came during Christmas. Herald is what you do when you come and you bring good news. You're the one who is the news teller, okay? But, you know, they come with this big, big bell, and he says, that's what I am. I'm somebody that brings the good news. I bring the gospel. And by the way, that is the most precious thing that you possess because it was the difference between you living for eternity, separated from God because of your sin, and living forever with him. Amen. It makes all the difference, doesn't it? It is really the most precious commodity that the church has. And the further we get away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ and from his word, the further and further we get away from the power of Jesus Christ in the church. It's found in the gospel. So he says he's here for the good news, and that's what he does. And we're in 1 Corinthians 15, we're given a very quick synopsis of what that gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8 says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Jesus died 
for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, by the way, that's Peter, and then by the 12, and that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So it wasn't a mirage. It wasn't imagination. It was verified by 500 witnesses of whom the greater part remain to the present. So there are first person people at the time of this writing who could tell you, yes, he was there, I saw him. But some have fallen asleep, which is the biblical term of dying. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. That's the apostle Paul speaking of his conversion experience when he was on the road to Emmaus and he was on his mount and he was going with a couple of soldiers who were guarding him because he was stirring up trouble, collecting Christians, having them delivered to justice, what they thought was justice, and death. Or maybe put in as lion food into the Colosseum. And that's what Saul did before he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, you know the story. There was this light that came that was brighter than the sun, and he couldn't look at it, and there was a voice and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Lord, who are you? And he says, I am the Lord Jesus Christ whom you persecute. He got knocked off his mount and he was blinded. The soldiers that were with him said, we heard thunder. We heard something, but we didn't hear a voice. Saul says, you, you didn't hear that? No, I didn't hear that. You know, it's funny. Sometimes you can even sit in a service and the Lord speak to you and nobody else heard it. You say, isn't it funny? That scripture, he, did he bring that up? I don't remember. It's funny because the Lord has a way of just honing in on you, doesn't he? And Paul says, I was the last one. Like somebody, like a mother who was, you know, two weeks overdue and had to be induced. That's who I was. That's basically the wording he used. Like one who's born out of time. Uh, like the baby who didn't want to, didn't want to go into the real world. So, that's what it is to have the gospel given to you. And if it's been given to you, you have an obligation to hand it to somebody else. Think of it like a game of hot potato. <laughs> you know, the tick, 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 tick. And then when the timer goes off, whoever's, you know, holding on to the, the hot potato, you know, loses. Well, the beautiful thing is there, there is a tick, 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 tick going on. And the world is winding down. Don't know if you noticed. Have you been on the internet, seen the TV, anything? Tick, 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 tick. Things are winding down, and the Lord's going to take us home, boys and girls. Because before he pours out wrath on a Christ-rejecting world, he's going to take his people home. He's going to take us home. Everybody's going to say, hey, whatever happened to that church? I hope they don't say, oh, there's still people who go there. <laughs> so, moving on. He says that Jesus Christ, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is the seed of David. The seed of David. Well, it's interesting. You, you think of the seed of David. Actually, the Greek word, and I want to ask you to repeat this, is sperma. The seed of David. It gives it a completely a biological background, doesn't it? So that's what... Jesus was to be, and it says that he was the seed of David, which means he's the offspring or the offshoot of David and of Jesse, and there, there are others. And throughout the scripture, there have been prophecies that the Messiah would come and be related to David, and that he would sit upon his throne forever. So we're not talking about just a natural descendant. We're talking about a descendant who would come and reign forever on a throne. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13, this is one of many of the passages when your days are fulfilled, this is God speaking, uh, this is God speaking through Samuel to David, uh, speaking through Nathan to David. He says, when your days are fulfilled and your rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Solomon. It, I, I, you guys weren't ready for the quiz, sorry. He's talking about Solomon. He shall build a house for my name. And we know it's Solomon who built the temple. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's where it twists. You see, because that throne wasn't forever, was it? 
He's saying, don't worry about it. You're going to have a descendant. When the descendant comes, he's going to build a house for me. He's going to sit on a throne. And the throne will last forever. And there'll be another one that comes who sits on that throne forever because people don't live forever. Only God does. But Jesus can. So it says in John 7, 42 about being the seed of David, has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? That was a question about Jesus because they called him Jesus of Nazareth. But we know where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem because there was this really cruel governor who decided I'm going to tax everybody and called everybody home to their hometown. And so he had to go, Joseph and his to-be wife, Mary, who was nine months pregnant, had to go to Bethlehem. And that's where he was born. Isn't it interesting how God uses even evil secular governments to accomplish his will? And so Jesus was taken and born in Bethlehem. And so we know that he was in Bethlehem from the seed of David. And it turns out that he's related to David on both sides. Mary, because he's actually physically uh, pinned to Mary because of his humanness. And Joseph, who was the rightful father, is also related to David. So there can't be an argument. God's pretty thorough. I like that. He, Paul also calls himself one who is declared to be that Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness and the resurrection from the dead. By the way, if you look, you'll see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit infused into this section. The Father did the planning, sent his son Jesus Christ, and was vindicated by the Spirit. Did you know, as you look through the scriptures, there are three people who are given the auspicious accolade of creating everything. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's interesting. They're all, one by one, listed as the Creator. And there are many, 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 many others. I could fill up the slide and fill up our time. But here's the thing. People say, well, there, there's nowhere specified there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, there is. It's everywhere. It's everywhere you look. And here's just one of those passages which talks about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It says that before God created everything, it says the earth was void. It was empty. And what hovered above the waters? The Spirit of God hovered above the waters, brooded above the waters. It's a, it's a picture of like uh, brooding a, a, a hen sitting over an egg and, and warming it so that it's going to give birth. It's the same exact picture, same exact language. So the spirit is attributed to creation. The father is attributed to creation. And we know in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus, he created all things. All things were created by him and for him. There's nothing that's been created that hasn't been created by him. So we see the creator is the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting. In heaven, we know that the angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Why three? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Lord, all God, is one, the Shema. It actually means that he's united. It doesn't mean that he's singular. The word does not mean singular. It means he's united. Anyway, I'm getting way off. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is that which declares that he is God. Because a human being, you know, it's appointed unto once a man to die and then the judgment and Jesus came back. He was resurrected. He wasn't resuscitated, which is different. If, you, if you've been in a hospital or uh, had, had the, the, the devastating traumatic event of having to bring somebody back to life, you know what it is to be resuscitated. That's a different thing. Jesus did that with, a, with three people that I'm aware of in the New Testament and brought them back to life. They were resuscitated. They weren't resurrected because Jesus was the first one that was resurrected from the dead. That's why part of the gospel is that he died. He really died. His physical body died, but he came back. He came back in a, in a resurrected body, much like you and I will have. I think he's the only one that will have scars, though. So he is declared by the resurrection. And in Psalm 16, uh, David writes from verses 9 and 10, no wonder my heart is glad. I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. 
This is a passage speaking about Jesus Christ, about his body would not stay and, and be degraded in the grave. And David is taking great consolation. He says, you know what? Why am I worried? I've got, I've got no worries because I know the Lord's not going to leave me to rot. He's going to take me home. I don't have to worry about, you know, all the crazy dreams that you might have about being stuck in a coffin and going, hey, let me out, let me out. You know, all the things that, you know, crazy movies are made out of. Why, why am I worried about death? I'm not worried about death because I know where I'm going. And I know who's going to take me home. And you know how I know? Because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And he said, if, if I go to prepare a place for you, know that I will come back and bring you with me. And that where I am, that's where you will be. That's what Jesus said. So what are you worried about? You got nothing to worry about. Death? Well, I'm not interested in the transition very much. But I'll tell you what, I know where I'm going. And it doesn't matter how it happens or when it happens. God's in charge of that. Amen. So I'm not worried about it. So you know what? Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. So in Acts 4.2, it says, These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus... There is a resurrection of the dead. It is the one thing that the disciples were characterized by in the very early church, the resurrection. Paul goes to Athens, Athens, Greece, and you know what he preaches on? The resurrection. So it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, we, we think of the cross as being the central figure of what Christianity is about, and it's a symbol for Christianity, but it was actually the resurrection from the dead that was the central theme of all of Christianity in the first century. So anyway, verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, he finally gets around to telling who he's writing to. It's a big, long introduction. To you guys. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I was writing a letter. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that there is a divine mission that he has. He says, through him we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name. He realizes God called me for a reason. He didn't call me just to, you know, get me saved and have me live out the rest of my life and wait on him to come and get me. You see, we have a mission, and I hope you guys are very well aware that you have a mission. God didn't save you just to, uh, you know, save you from burning. God saved you for something as much as he saved you from something. In fact, I would say more so. God saved you for something. The, the mode that, that he uses is Christ, the mission is to go out among all the nations. And, and it's a mandate to be obedient. And it's to whom? It's to the multitude. It's to everybody. There is nobody who is not, uh, there's no one exempt from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what nation they come from, what color they are, how old they are. Everyone is supposed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so we tell everybody. It doesn't matter if they're antagonistic towards the gospel, because I'll tell you what, I was. I had a guy share with me about who Jesus Christ was, and I was in his car, and, uh, and my, pressed my face up against the, the window. It was a cold day, I remember it. And I said, oh, my God, he's a Jesus freak. <laughs> Happened to be my, my boss at work. His name is Brian. Uh, well, God bless you, Brian. Shared with me week after week. I was dealing drugs bringing him in the car. He was driving me to work. I was dealing drugs at work. He said, what's with the big bag? I said, it's my lunch. I'm a big eater. Liar. And eventually the Spirit of God touched my heart and opened up my mind and helped me to understand who Jesus was. And I knew I needed a Savior because I was lost. He saved me for a reason. And so I pray that you guys would do the same as me and share what it is that God's done for you. Because to keep it a secret really is um, its the worst way of shortchanging somebody of the greatest gift that we've been given. So, 
we also have this divine mission. We too have this calling as Paul did to the Roman believers, as well as the Roman believers, is to take that which we understand about eternity and how God has made a way for us to be made right with him, that his justice, that we deserve punishment. Don't you hate it when people deserve punishment and they don't get it? Unless it's not you. <laughs> if it's you not getting punishment, you're, you're good with that, right? <laughs> I'm good with grace for me and justice for everyone else. I cry out that everyone else get punished for what they've done wrong, but I accept grace and I'm glad to get it. Well, shouldn't it be shared? Shouldn't I be willing to share the grace of God with other people because I've been a recipient of the grace of God and this giant list of things that he had against me that I would have been taken to court at the end of my life and been accused of, I no longer have to stand before God and do because Jesus took it. He took it on the cross. All of my sin, all of my shame, all of my guilt, he took on the cross, and he did for you as well. And anyone else who would choose to believe in Jesus Christ, and it's by faith. So he's telling the Romans that they have this calling, that they too. It, now remember, the Romans were the ones who hung Jesus on a cross, right? Coordinated with the, the religious Jews of that time and the people together who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. There's no one innocent in this crowd. In fact, the disciples themselves all scattered like rats. There's nobody who's innocent. In fact, I know Jesus died for me, and it was me who put him on the cross, because if it wasn't for my sin, he never would have went. So the Romans, I would say, one of the chief players, and here there are people getting saved in Rome. I mean, in the very heart of Satan's territory, you might say. These are the people who have come in and taken the Jews captive and made them slaves. And here are people that are getting saved in Rome. I think that's amazing. If he can do that, he can save anybody. Amen? Amen. 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 So, and he gives them the traditional grace and peace. Grace is what you receive from God when you don't get what you deserve. That's mercy. And, and you get something you don't deserve. And that's grace. That's God's love. That's the freedom from your sins. That's a, a life that's been made new. It's everlasting life from the time you accept Christ all the way to the end of eternity, which there's no end. That's God's grace, where he doesn't hammer you and you deserve it. He doesn't, and he gives you things instead. We take on the righteousness of Christ, and Jesus takes upon our sin. That is the grace of God, and of course, it always results in the peace. You know, there's two different types of peace. There's peace with God because I'm no longer his enemy. I'm not fighting him anymore. And then there's the peace of God. The scripture talks about having peace with God because we're not enemies anymore. But then he talks about the peace of God. The peace of God is the peace that God has knowing he's got it all under control. Do you know that you could have that? Amen. Blasphemy. <laughs> you can have the peace of God because the scripture says so in Philippians, right? We're supposed to not worry about anything, pray about everything. And through prayer and thanksgiving. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So just so you know, there's peace with God through Jesus Christ in the sacrifice. Then there's the peace of God. You can have peace with God and not have the peace of God. There's another peace. Pun intended, sorry. So he gives them this greeting, which is uh, something we struggle with now that we have masks and disease. And... Anyway, so he gives them a, a verbal greeting. Grace and peace. Verse 8, he says, first, it's always nice to start there. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, which shows he's from the south somewhere, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. He says, you guys have faith. And he says, the whole world knows about it. People are talking about people in Rome. Those people in Rome, there's people who give their life to Jesus Christ. And by the way, there was a time in which all of the Christians were cast out of Rome. All the Jews were cast out of Rome. And they believed that Christianity was just a sect of Judaism because they believed in the Jewish Messiah. So they cast them all out, and then there was Nero and the burning and all that craziness. You might be aware. Anyway, so he cast, everybody gets cast out, and he says, your faith is being spoken of throughout the world. Everybody knows about you Christians. 
And this was a church that Paul couldn't even take the pride to say he planted. It just happened. We know in, in the second chapter of Acts, there were people from Rome who came and they heard the word of God that day through Peter and they were baptized. There were 5,000 were added to that number that day. And there were Romans among them. It's stated very specifically. And so they ended up going back with the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing that with everybody. And it's, this church kind of started with a work of the Spirit, which is an amazing thing, right? So it wasn't a church plant. It was something that the Spirit of God actually did spontaneously. And he says, your faith is being spoken of by everybody. Boy, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I, I was talking to a couple of guys yesterday up the street, and they said, so what do you do? And, and, and they said it like in a godfathery sort of way. So what do you do? I said, I kill people. And I thought they'd be surprised, and they were like, oh, okay. You know, and I was like, I said, I didn't mean it. I was just kidding. And he goes, well, you know, usually people have a front. They do something else, and then they kill people on the side. <laughs> and so I told him, I'm a pastor. And, of course, instantly they put the frosted flakes on. They went, oh, <laughs> isn't that nice, <laughs> pastor? It's like, oh, it's ruined. It's out of the bag. Now they're not being real with me. I didn't like that. But anyway, so they say, where do you go to church? Where's your flock, I think they said. I said... It's up here in North Middletown, Ocean. And so I got to share with them a little bit. And they're like, oh. And I was half expecting studying this that they would say, wait a minute. I know. Doesn't Glenn Fox go to your church? <laughs> or for them to say, doesn't Wayne Applegate go to your church? You know, I, I expected them, almost half expected them to say that they knew somebody that went here. Because when you know Jesus Christ and you're solid in his word, and the Spirit of God is working in your life, it makes an impression on everybody around you, doesn't it? Like, like a rock in a pool. It, the, the waves go out. And so I'm always expecting to run into somebody. And uh, I, we went to Homedale for our picnic, and the, the guy who was coming up, who was the ranger, you know, making sure they were not doing anything wrong. And, you know. Anyway, got to talk to him, and he was just the nicest guy, and uh, got to tell him it was a church picnic and all. And it turns out he's a believer, and he knows several people that go to this church. And it was like, check that out. That's an exciting thing, to know that people's faith isn't a secret. They're not carrying it around a little box like, I better not tell anybody, though. I think I'm crazy. But they're telling people about Jesus, because they care more about the souls of other people than they do about getting rejected. And that's basically the bottom line of what that is. I think back to 3 John in what was written he says, I take no greater joy this. He says, for I rejoice greatly when, you, when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. It's one of those things where it is such a joy to know that when Christians call themselves Christians, they're actually doing the deed. They're walking the walk. It's not just words. They're really, really following Jesus and making an impact in ways that maybe you don't even know on the people around you. And you might not be the person that's going to um, see them get saved. You might be the one who's planting a seed. You might be the one who's cultivating the soil. But it's God who gives the increase. So never be ashamed and never feel bad about confessing who you know. You know the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, your faith has been through the entire world of that time. Verse 9, for God is my witness. By the way, did you, did you ever know that that's where it comes from? This from the scripture? God is my witness. It's almost like swearing, right? For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So he says, I'm, I'm praying. I pray for you all the time, but I'm praying that I can actually come and meet you because he hasn't met them yet. He hasn't been to this church yet. And I told you about the conundrum where he was. He's in Corinth and he could, he could move on, but he's got all this cash he's got to deliver. And so he actually had to turn around, go back to Jerusalem. And little did he know he would get airmailed <laughs> to Rome and he would actually get his... Um, he would get his appointment there. Praying faithfully in the will of God. I want you to notice what he does. 
He has a specific thing that he asks for in prayer, but he prays for it in the will of God. So there's a way that we can pray and we're bossing God around, right? You better get on this, God. I'm not you guys, but there is a way that people can talk to God like they're trying to tell him what to do. And then there's another way where you can say, Lord, I'd really like you to do this if, if you're willing. Are you willing? Do you want to do this? And I think it shows a sensitivity in prayer that I don't just go to him and, and start barking out orders and tell him what I want. I go to him and I say, Lord, you know, there's this terrible thing that's going on. Could you help? Please. And I think that's how we speak to God. I think we speak with reverence, and we should. So he says he's praying faithfully in the will of God. You might not know it, but this letter was delivered to the Romans three years before he was able to show up by a, a girl named Phoebe. When we get to chapter 16, you'll see uh, it says uh, she's from Centuria, and she actually is the deliverer of this um, book of Romans to the Romans. And uh, he ends up getting delivered to Rome three years later, but it's because he's going before Caesar and having to give a defense for what he believes. So he got a free trip. He says, yeah, I want to come and visit you guys, but it wasn't time, so he had to go back to Jerusalem. He got in some deep trouble, and they basically captured him and sent him to Rome, which is where he wanted to go anyway, before he ended up going to Spain and, and going further uh, when the gospel went further on the third um, missionary journey. But it was delivered by Phoebe, which I always find funny. <laughs> but now I'll never forget the book of Romans was delivered by Phoebe. Verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. His, his passion for them is I, I, I so desire to come there that I might give you a spiritual gift. I love that. He says, I want to come to establish you. I want you guys to be a solid church. I want you to do even better than what you're doing right now. And I want you to be established. And I, I'm coming with a gift. And he says, well, that sounds a little cocky. Well, I'm actually looking forward to the give and take. I'm looking for, you know, like the give and take. You know, uh, you guys know what that is, right? Church isn't always about just giving, although some of us in ministry can get our minds on that that's all it's about. I got to go to church. I got to preach a sermon. I got to do worship. I got to run the sound system. I got to keep, I got to get the cameras right. I got to, you know, where's that stinking message? You know, like you get all oh, the chairs and, and, the, and the, the sanitization of everything and the, the bathrooms and the doors and, you know, are the, are the blinds down? Are the lights on? Is it, you know, there's all of that that we can get so distracted by. And I was... The Lord spoke to me this morning about that. But he says, I want to come to bring a gift. I want to come to serve. I want to be the, the slave of all. I want to come and bring you a spiritual gift to establish you. But I'm also looking forward to receiving from you. And, you know, receiving a gift is always nice too, right? You know, there's a way to do that. Maybe you don't know. There, there is there's a way to receive a gift. It's, you know, Christmas is not the time where you go, oh, and you unwrap everything and you go, that's all. I don't know about you, but I had kids. That's rather childish. There's, you should always, I don't know about you, when you go to people's house, do you feel like you should bring something? By the way, we had an awesome picnic because you all brought something. We had tables and tables and tables and tables of food. We had to give it all away. Glenn got a lot of it. <laughs> but we had lots and lots and lots of food. Um, I only know that because we had extra food yesterday and, and we didn't have anywhere for it to go, so we gave it to Glenn. He happened to be here. So when everybody brings a little something, boy, what, what a joy it is. It's, it's trouble when everybody comes together and expects to be served. And that's, that's not a Christ-like heart. So here's Paul saying, I'm wanting to come and give. I, I'm prepared to give. I'm, I'm ready to give. And I got a gift for you. I want to establish your church. I want to see you guys take off. I want to contribute. You know, I want to do what I can. But also, I'm looking forward to what, what you got. Which, if you don't have anything, you're like, uh-oh. He's coming here looking for something. <laughs> can you imagine... Stopping you at the door and saying, listen, you got your mask, you got your gloves, you're fully dressed, you combed your hair, good. Now, what have you got? What have you got to contribute? Oh, I, I, I didn't realize it was one of those churches that you've got to bring something. 
I wonder, you know, if, if, you, if you come prepared, you're like, you're like really, especially if it's your favorite recipe, and you're like, you got to have some of this. Some of my mac and cheese. You got to have, this is mac and cheese like you've never had. Okay? You know, there, and that's what you do when you have something to give. You're actually anxious to give it. You're proud to give it. You're, you, you display it and you popularize it and you hope everyone tries it and feels the joy of the fat and carbs that you have created. I'm sorry, I'm talking to myself because I'm salivating. So, but number one, his motive was to serve. Number two was to receive. And you know, you should be ready to receive when you come to church. You should be ready to give when you come to church. Amen. I want to come to a place where I'm full spiritually and emotionally and mentally and, and so that I'm not distracted and I have something to give away. I have something here for you. Because if I stood up here and had nothing to give for you, I'd, there'd be no sense in you sitting there listening. So, it's like we're all scratching each other's back. <laughs> the scripture uses the word koinonia, which is... It's this mutual affection. It's this, we're all sharing in this together. It's not like I'm coming to scratch your back. Don't touch me. It's I'm coming to scratch your back and I'm willing to have my back scratched as well. And sometimes that's some hard things that maybe you don't want to hear, right? It's like you need to cut that out with the thing that you're doing, you know, on every Thursday or whatever. You need to cut that out. Or... So sometimes we have to let people do that. Verse 13 now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also. He's talking about a gift from them. Just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So that's kind of a thing to get pumped up about. Uh, for those of you who don't know, what the, who don't know what this is, this is a map. Yeah. And maybe you don't know what these are, but you, if you belong to the Auto Club of America, you, they used to give you one. If you said you were going somewhere, they give you a map. You just flip the pages, and it takes you through all the, the road names and everything. It's a map. And how many of you don't know what a map is? All right, well, I'm beating you up unnecessarily. Okay, well, that's a map. And he says, listen, I wanted to let you know, I, I wanted to come to you a lot sooner. And he never gave an excuse of not having a map or any of that kind of thing. He says he had a desire to come sooner, but he wasn't able to. And in fact, as he's writing this in Corinth, he's not able to either. We know it takes him three years to end up catching up. Uh, so Phoebe gets there long before him uh, with the map. And he says, I'm ready. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. What he's doing is he's winding up and he's saying, Guys, I'm about to, to hit you with some information. I hope you're, you're all buckled in because he starts talking immediately about the wrath of God being revealed against men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And he goes on to talk about lost people and how sin has destroyed our world and how we can make our way back to God through Jesus Christ. But he's, he reminds me of Rocky, you know. You know so he's, he's prepared uh, like that guy right there. So I'm ready. So next week, next week, we're going to pick it up from verse 16, which says, when he says, I'm ready, I am ready to preach the gospel. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk 4.2. So we're going to get into it and talk about what is this that he refers to. By the way, this is probably, if you had a heading for the entire book of Romans, it would be right here. So we're going to go over that next week. I pray that you guys are going to be here.